I did my first scroll in April of 2000. I've been scribing off and on ever since. Um, I've taken a few years off here and there, so I won't say I've been a scribe for 20 years, but I've probably been a scribe for 15. Um, I ran a local scriptorium for a couple of years. I have done commissions, private commissions for people outside the SCA as well as in. I'm not a laurel. There are plenty of things I don't know so if you hear me say something and you're going, wait a second, that, that runs counter to what I've been taught, feel free to speak up because it's very possible that I'm not right. Um, I have around here, where did I put them? I have a class handout. It's not necessary to have the handout in front of you. I mean, it's nice, but it's not a requirement, but I am going to go off the handout just real quick as an intro before we get started. Um, I've worked with several different guilders adhesives, gilding bases over the years, and um, I want to make clear what we're using is called gesso, but if you go to the art store and you try to buy gesso, you'll get the wrong stuff, because acrylic painters and oil painters use something called gesso to smooth their canvases before they start painting. This stuff is not that. Uh, it is a period recipe that I'm working with today. The only difference that I know of is that they have substituted, instead of using very toxic lead white, they are using um, uh, titanium white, which is non-toxic. Yay! So I'm not gonna poison myself while I work on this today. Um, I've worked with, you can get this stuff, it's called Jerry Tresser's Liquid Gesso. There it is. You can get it at jtresser.com or you can go to John Neal Bookseller and you can get it and it's great. Um, it's a little pricey, but it'll last you a long time and it is the best gilding of material I have ever worked with. Um, I'll get into why and how in just a second. I've also used an acrylic recipe gesso, like it started with an acrylic base and then used uh, bulking agents. And I've used something called Kilner Miniatum which you can get from John Neal, and it promises a mirror smooth finish and everything else. And you know, I was never quite able to get what I wanted out of it. I don't know if it was because I was impatient or if my technique was wrong, but as it dried, it would shrink and it would crinkle, like, like the back of your hand, just all wrinkles all the way through it. And because it was sort of plasticky, you couldn't buff those out or sand them or scrape them, they were just wrinkled. And when you put your gold down, it's going to show every flaw and every bit of texture. I mean, it's kind of fun when you flat gild onto textured paper because the texture of the paper will come through your gold. You'll see it. But when you're looking for nice mirror smooth raised gilding, not so much. So I'm using Jerry Tresser's gesso. It is based off the period recipe. Um, and like I said, it's one of the best things I've ever used because it, it, doesn't seem to shrink or dimple or wrinkle as much as the other products. Um, I've got a commission I'm working on here. Let me just put this here. I got impatient with this and got carried away and filled it with dimples and wrinkles and things. And even then it doesn't look that bad. I'm gonna be able to file or sand or polish the errors out of this. And then I'll be able to gild this entire, it's a five by seven card. I'll be able to gild all over the place and it's gonna look great. But there are places, like if you look here, there's a big dimple in this one where the air bubble popped. So, I mean, it's not perfect, but most of that was down to me being impatient, not down to the product itself. If you look at the sample card, I wanted to get myself ahead a little bit and not have to wait 24 hours for the next step in the process. Um, there's a very fine, kind of wrinkle in this one. And I don't even know if it shows up very well. I'll try and bring it in there. You can barely, you can barely see it on the camera and in person it's barely visible as well. And that's from where I painted a thin layer down and let it dry. And then I glopped it on thick. And as it dried, it did still shrink. As the water evaporates out, it's gonna shrink. But the plaster that's in there keeps it from shrinking very far. And these dimples are almost nothing to get rid of. 
your biggest problem is going to be from air bubbles and that's mainly don't shake it and don't stir it too vigorously when you're ready to use it. Mm. Uh, it stores in your fridge. It'll keep for years. When it comes out, it's very, very, very thick. Give it about 15 minutes to, draw, to, to come to room temperature and it'll be fine. You know, I, I, with this commission piece that I just showed you, it was super thick and it was cold and I was really worried. Um, and so I stirred it really vigorously and uh, put a whole bunch of air bubbles in it. Um, I just saw a chat message that says somebody is not able to see what I'm talking about. They're only seeing my face. If you look through, there is one window that has my hand on it right now. See if you can pin that or click on it to make it your main window. If not, hopefully the rum chancellor will be able to do something. I pinned it myself, so I'm seeing it as the, as the main screen. So hopefully that'll, that'll solve for you. It's a technical issue because I'm using two cameras. Sometimes the one camera doesn't show up the way that it should. But anyway, for anybody who's joined that I haven't seen, welcome, welcome. I'm happy that you're here. So the first thing you do when you, when you guild is you're going to draw your areas that you want to put the gold down on. And these are large and exaggerated. We come back to my commission piece. I just Look how made tiny. It front screen, so it should be that way for everybody now. Okay, thank you. If you look at how tiny these leaves are compared to these leaves, and how tiny these dots are compared to this dot, working smaller like that is a little tricky, but it's the same principle. You draw where you want to gild first, and then you take, you stir up your gesso, but not too much, and you just paint a thin layer down, spread it out. And what this is going to do, the first time I gilded with this material, I didn't let it dry very long. The edges dried faster than the middle, and then I wasn't able to get the gold to stick on the edges. But I think that's because I only left it to dry for like three hours instead of overnight. The second time I did it, I painted a thin layer down like this, just left it be. It dried in about an hour. And it goes from sort of light like this to a little bit darker, a little darker. It's not a huge difference, especially on this camera. We also got um, uh, more of a matte finish instead of a shiny finish. So you'll be able to tell when it's dry. Once it is dry, come back with your brush and you put a bead in the middle of your shape and then you just sort of tease it. You don't want to paint with it because you don't want too many brush strokes, especially if you're doing a larger area. You just kind of want to pull it and tease it, let it flow along. My brush isn't actually touching the paper right now. It's just sort of dragging the liquid, if you can see that. And then once I've got it filled in as far as I want it to go, I'm going to just feed that some more and let it build up and bulk up. Should have done that over here because I'm going to want access to these in just a minute and not have wet hands. <laughs> oh well. Now this would be a very long class if we went real time because the next thing you do is let it dry as long as you can. Um, overnight is not bad. I really like this material because like when I worked with Miniatum, one of the things they said was, you've got 24 hours and then it won't stick at all anymore. It just sort of dries too far. It's like, well, that's useless. I need something I can come back to. Can you let it dry for a, a very long time, like a couple days? According to the manufacturer, the guy that makes this stuff, you've got up to a week. So you can leave it as long as, you know, if you've got a busy life going on and you have time to paint and then you can't come back to it for a couple days, you're fine. I would maybe layer, you know, cover it with something or protect it so it doesn't get dust in it, maybe. But I'm not even too worried about that. Getting my teaching materials out of the way. So you've so also can... done like one thin layer and then kind of a thick globby layer. Would yes. it also be useful if you do have a bit of time to play with it to do like a more few layers? Bigger layers? And, and yeah. black on a thick layer, or is there is there like a too much? 
Um, I had somebody look at this and insist that I had it too thick and that that was my problem getting the edges to stick. And I'm like, it's raised gilding. You want it to be, you know, raised. <laughs> um, so I don't think you can go too thick with it personally. But I've also, um, I had to recently replace my entire scribal kit. And I've only had these materials for a few weeks, unfortunately. So I've not done a whole lot of experimenting, but if you wanted to do something like that, I think that's actually a really good idea. See if you see if it works better to build multiple thin layers or see if pooling and glopping works. Now, if you go to Jerry Tresser's website, the guy who makes this stuff, he has a couple of instructional videos and he doesn't even start with a bottom layer. He just feeds it directly onto the page and builds it up nice and thick and leaves it to dry. I just happened to have not great experience with that when I first tried it. So I'm doing the thin layer first and then bulking over the top of it. Now the beauty of this material, something I cannot get from any other gesso, any other gilding preparation, you can burnish it. Remember how we were talking about you can't put gold onto textured paper or the texture of the paper will show through? I mean, if you put gold on your fingertip, you'll see your fingerprints. It's very thin, it's very delicate, you're gonna see it. It'll show up fine on gesso if you don't burnish it, but if you do, this will actually go shiny. It'll go from matte to gloss with very little effort. You can go around the edges with the tip. This is an agate dog tooth burnisher. They usually run about 50, 30 to 50 bucks, depending on where you get them. Dog tooth refers to the shape. Agate is what it's made out of. It's a very pretty stone. The last one I had before I had to replace it was a lovely brown and clear stripey stone. It was really pretty, made me happy. So I don't know if this is going to show up well on the camera. I forgot to turn my kitchen light on. There it is. Can you see yeah. it shine? It goes from matte over here to glossy with some burnishing. And you can put quite a bit of pressure on it, which is what surprised me. I was really worried that I would, you know, crack this or blast it off the page or whatever. But you can really, it'll take a pounding. I'm gonna switch cards because I don't wanna put my gold leaf on anything that's wet and this all here is still wet. This is a leaf from Saturday. I gilded all of these cause I was excited. I got carried away and I gilded them all. I didn't gild this one, but a couple bits of stray gold got left behind. I'm putting quite a bit of force on this and, and when you do it in person, Go ahead and test it, play with it. You start gentle if you want and work your way up. But I'm putting more force on this than I ever thought I would be, that would be possible. Yeah. Uh, set the gesso, set the burnisher aside. And let's look at that under the camera. Some of that shine is from gold, I admit, but some of it is because I've polished it really super smooth. Will it be an issue if you have gold um, already there? Nope, because real gold sticks to itself. Real gold is awesome. Fake gold is problematic. Okay. Um, some people, when they first start gilding, you know, they, they are hesitant, and I understand this, they're hesitant to outlay a ton of money on an expensive product, but it's a chemical thing. The element gold simply behaves differently from composite leaf. The most common ingredient in composite is, I think, copper and tin, because it's brass leaf, basically. It's yellow, but it does not behave the same. And it'll give you problems. If you gild with regular gold, it's actually a little bit more forgiving than the composite stuff, because it'll stick to itself. It'll stick to the oils in your skin. Um, if you have my brush go. Where did my brush go? Oh, right here. This mop, this is a real simple, cheapy makeup brush, but you can also buy paint brushes that are floofy like this. If you get into the habit of fidgeting and brushing this across your chin or along your nose or whatever, which I do, 
it'll pick up the oils from your skin and the gold will stick and you'll have a harder time gilding. So keep this absolutely clean. But it loves oils, it loves humidity. Now for the gold itself, let's set this aside. This is 23 karat gold. Um, the two X's mean that it's double thickness. You can buy triple thickness, which is closer to what they used in period. They, they use the same methods for making gold leaf that they do now, pounding it thin but we have machines to do it that pound it more consistently and also pound it thinner. There are places where if you hold a sheet of gold leaf up to the light, it's slightly translucent. You can actually get a little bit of light through it, which is why you want a color on your gesso. Some people use a dark red gesso because it helps reflect a deeper gold color. It's really cool. The pink is sufficient. You can see where it is but a darker, there's nothing wrong with a darker gesso. This is 23 karat gold, and then what I have here is patent gold, and patent, static electricity sticks it to a sheet of tissue paper. I don't have to tell you how much easier it is to handle something that you can pick up with your fingers. You don't have to use tweezers, you don't have to worry about the wind brushing it away if you exhale wrong, because gold leaf is light enough and thin enough you don't wanna sneeze when you're working. I have in the past taken my shirt and put up over my mouth and nose so that no breath would get on the page while I was handling leaf because it'll scatter right across your table. Mm. But so you get this stuff. After you've burnished your gesso, you breathe on it. You can use a breathing tube or you can just pick it up and you know directly exhale or you can stick your face over it and, and exhale. You wanna be careful of two things. If you do not use a breathing tube and you lean over your work, you may salivate and drip on it, which is embarrassing. I've done it. Ask me how I know it's embarrassing. It's like, oh, well, I can't control my drool. On the other hand, if you do use a tube, you're gonna wanna use paper or cardboard or reed. A lot of people are like, oh, I just use a big, you know, big drinking straw, plastic straw. Like, yeah, but plastic doesn't absorb any moisture, which means it's gonna condense in there and you run the risk of it dripping also. I mean, it won't be saliva, but it'll still be dripped on your gold or on your gesso and can ruin your work or, or cause problems and delays. So what I'm going to do is pick this up and just breathe on it. And it's just like fogging a mirror. You're not blowing. It's not a cool stream of air. It's moisture that you want. So go like way back in your throat and just, you know, like you're a heavy breather on the other end of the phone. <laughs> and I'll do it once or twice usually. And that moisture is sufficient to get it tacky and then you put the gold leaf down, roll your finger around to get the edges a little bit, go forward and backward and sideways, and then peel back. And now you have gilded, congratulations. And yes, it really is this easy. If you have a lot of excess, you can use your mop brush to flip it up and over and onto the surface Oh, I see what's going on. I had a smudge on there from Saturday and it's sticking to the smudge. But you can get this to stick to itself. Now at the moment, it doesn't look great. Most gold leaf comes in a glassine envelope. Glassine is your friend. You can also buy sheets of glassine. But if you've got the envelope, just use the envelope. You can also go to the post office. Some things, I think stamp envelopes ship in glassine. It's just crinkly and translucent and wonderful stuff. Don't touch the side that you're gonna use. You don't wanna get oils on it. You lay the glassine down and you get your burnisher back out. And you start gentle. And little by little, you add more force. And the gold will stick to itself and it'll stick to the gesso. Just be lovely stuff. Another thing that this particular gesso does that I've not seen from any other product 
if you read instruction manuals or if you talk to pros, they'll be like, oh, and then you can, you can burnish directly onto the gold. And I've never gotten that to work. Usually you burnish onto the gold and what happens is you rub the gold off and you go, oh crap, and you have to start all over again. This stuff, very first time I tried it, I was able to burnish directly onto the gold. It was mind blowing and it was so, so cool. Um, what I'm gonna do is take the mop brush and all this is for is cleaning up your ragged edges. You go from a sloppy shape to a clean shape instantly. And this is my favorite part. This is my absolute favorite part of gilding. You lay the shiny down and you peel it away and it's all messy and then you hit it with the brush and poof, you've got the shape that you wanted. It just is so cool. It's like instant gratification. And then you get glitter too, which is always nice. So like I said, you can burnish directly onto the gold. Start gentle again and work your way up. Use the flat part of your dog tooth and spread it around and smooth it out and press it into place. And it's not rubbing off. This is what blows my mind. No other gilling preparation that I have ever used lets me do what they say you can do with the period stuff, which is why I like it very much. So I, I looked real quick and I saw that that gesso was available in very small little containers, like a fourth of an ounce and a half an ounce, I think. This is my yeah. quarter ounce bottle. Yeah. Yeah. How long might that last? Like, are we talking like, well, depending on how much you use it, of course. I mean, yeah, obviously it's going to depend how much you use it. But I mean, for, for this leaf here that I glopped on nice and thick and that is about twice as large as a real leaf that I would be using. I used maybe two drops of it, right? Three, if you count the thin layer that I put down underneath. So, so you're using teeny tiny drops and a relatively small brush and, and I think I'll be able to make this last quite a bit. Now, mind you, that card that I showed you is five by seven, is covered in gold, and the commission that I have with the client is to make four of them. So I might run out of gesso, I'm not sure but I know where I can get more and that makes me happy. Also with the, um, the breathing tube, so, yeah. or, or the breathing uh, process. Uh, yeah, if, breathing. Yeah, if you have like say a larger piece, like, like maybe a page size that you're gilding around in, is it, is it problematic if you like get some of it activated, but then don't work on that spot right away? Like if you try and do it in stages, Oh no, you can definitely do it in stages. Um, if you're do gilding a large area, you're gonna wanna watch out that your ground doesn't buckle. Perg is terrible for this. Perg is awful for gilding. I'm one of the few rebels that does not like working on Perg and it's because I gild quite a bit. Um, vellum is very responsive to moisture, so it'll buckle at first, but then it'll breathe and unbuckle again. Uh, paper will warp a little bit, but not too bad, but perg is just the worst. So if you're doing a large area, you may um, just don't work with perg, but, but when it comes down to actually laying the gold down, it's possible that you would prefer to work with loose leaf. And with loose, you actually use scissors or a gilder's knife to cut it into squares, and then you lay overlapping squares onto your area and make sure they overlap because again it's real gold that's going to stick to itself and you tack them all down and you burnish it really good and you brush away the excess and the worst that you'll get you may get some of the overlap flake away but there won't be a seam a visible seam if you did it right my cat is on my kitchen counter that's a little distracting um Real quick, uh, speaking yeah. of vellum, do you have like a favorite way to get vellum if you don't like perg? Um, there is an SCA supplier who has an Etsy shop. And the name of the shop, I don't know how you pronounce it, but it's spelled A-S-O-F-A, -A, a sofa. Or maybe it means something else, I don't know. But um, David Bianco is his name. You can find him on Facebook in the Facebook Scribes groups as well. He, uh, he knows his stuff, he uses period materials, 
Another good source that I've found, a lot of people swear by pergamena.net. Their stuff is very good, but it's quite pricey. I recently just discovered, what in the world are you doing, Kat? So I, I, a friend of mine owns a pond and has reeds growing at the edge of their pond. And I said, I need a reed for a breathing tube. And they harvested a bunch of reeds for me. And I cut them to a usable length today. And I've got them sitting in a colander drying out. And the cat just pulled one of the reeds out of the colander and is using it as a cat toy on the kitchen floor now. Hardships, first world problems, the life of a scribe. Annoying cats are period too, by the way, but that's a whole other topic. Um, let me see. I want very much to try and gild on this shiny one again, but I'm worried about the wet here. So give me a second to see if this will work. I like gilding so much that once I get started, I don't want to stop. And also it's only 7.30. I'm doing my heavy breathing right now. If you wear glasses and you fog up your own glasses, you're doing it right. Here we go. I'm going to use my mop. Stop it. Brush that away. Bam. Instant shape. And it looks so good. And it just makes me so happy. Um, you, when you gild capital letters, for example, it's a weird shape. And so sometimes the gold will pull off in a weird shape and you'll get like hollow spaces in the letter that are covered in gold or wonky edges or whatever. It just looks like a mess. And then you attack it with your mop and bam, there it is. And it's beautiful. And it, uh, it's so satisfying. I am not over this. I'm like a little kid when it comes to gilding. I will sit there and just giggle at my own work. It's, it's sad. <laughs> not very professional, but true. But again, when you polish this and it's shiny, the gold underneath is going to be that much shinier. There it is. And that's what you want. That's what we're after. Nice. Uh, I love gilding. Uh, do we have any other questions? Like where we buy stuff, what, what materials you need? I think I followed all the steps in the class handout. Mm -hmm. Let me look at the class handout real quick. Step one. Compound, does it have a shelf life? And you know, in other words, like some paints, if I don't use it within two years, it doesn't do well. Yeah, they said if you keep this, they said if you keep this in the fridge, it'll last for years. I did have someone I was talking to say that they had some that they hadn't touched in over two years and when they pulled it out it had gone a little moldy. Mm. So I'm not sure. I haven't owned this long enough to have it spoil. I've only owned it for a few weeks because like I said I had to completely replace my scribal kit. It's, it was a pain. Um, but yeah, this, this is not supposed to spoil very quickly. You just, it, it will separate. Right now it's nice and thick and pink all the way through, but when you first open it, there'll be a thin yellow layer. I suspect he's using glare, but I'm not sure. Glare is egg white. Another one down, you are such a brat. Heather, I got in here 15 minutes late, so I didn't see the first 15 minutes, obviously. Okay. Do you, did you tape this and are you going to post it? I did, and it's also on Facebook Live right now, so hopefully you'll be able to Great. watch it after that. Okay. But uh, the Royal University of the Mid-Realm records all their classes, and then with permission from the teacher, they get posted to YouTube. So yes, you will absolutely be able to watch this. And if you want, I mean, I can go back over the steps. It's not like it's hard. Well, it looks like you just, what, layered your gesso and let it dry and then put the gilding on it, right? Mm -hmm. Thin layer first, let it dry for about an hour. Thick, gloppy layer, let that dry overnight, just to make sure. I mean, after three hours, it's dry enough, but it might be soft and squishy on the inside and you might ruin it. You need best to just let it sit overnight. Uh, burnish it. This particular gesso, you can directly burnish. If you look and see 
how this is sort of matte here and this is sort of matte here. I'm gonna polish this one and then show you the comparison. You actually can put quite a bit of force on this with your burnisher. Doop -de -doop -de -do. Go around the edges, make it look nice. This is also good if you have like little bumps or little dimples, they can polish out. They may not completely, you may have to hit it with a nail file or sandpaper or something or a scalpel but they should polish out. Now look at the difference in, I don't know if the shine is showing up. There it is. There's the shine. But right, this one stayed matte, this one is now all shiny. And the smoother it is, the better your gold is gonna look when you lay it down. Can you so, um, texturize on top of the, the raised gold? Yes. I, I think I know you can do that with the, the flattish gold. I don't know about tooling flat gilding, to be honest, but this was an experimental piece that I did on April 28th and 29th and 30th. Um, the first few didn't go as well, and then I re-gilded and they turned out great. I don't have any embossing styluses right now, so I used the tip of a mechanical pencil. I took the lead out of the way, so it was just the, the round tip, and I just put a row of dots on this particular one, and it, it I was worried about the gesso cracking. It didn't doesn't seem to have cracked. I was worried about it, you know, shattering and falling off the page. It didn't do that. We have some discussion. There's another scribe. Oh crap, I can't remember her name. She likes to tool the gesso first and then gild. I like to gild and then tool what's there. Um, I don't think there's, I don't think either of those is wrong, and I have no idea which they did in period. I do know they tooled gold in period. I did a scroll based on the Luttrell Psalter, and if you get a chance to look at it online, zoom in on some of the capitals, the tooling is fantastic. Um, gosh, I would have to go hunting and, and find a photo and then screen share so you could see it. But I, I brag about that one all the time. I did, did it a couple of years ago and I'm ridiculously proud of it because it's got, it's got a fairly large capital letter. It's a capital D and there's a portrait inside, but all the rest of it around the guy is gold. And the gold is tooled with vine work. And it just looks so good. I loved how it turned out. Now that was not this, that was um, the miniatum, but this does take tooling. I've never actually tried to tool flat gold because I figured there wasn't anything there to tool into. You know what I mean? The gold is there, but the gold is so thin and then the paper is right under it. I wasn't sure that it would show. Do you have oh, no, wait, no, that's not, hard? What's that? Oh, sorry. Did did you have to press pretty hard when you're tooling into the, the gesso? I pressed harder on this than I did the miniatum, but I don't know if that's because I was using a mechanical pencil instead of a proper stylus, or if it was because the uh, the material miniatum was softer. I suspect it's a little bit of both, because the miniatum is definitely sort of soft and squishy. Hmm. You can you can burnish it through glassine, but you can't burnish it directly. It'll you'll pull the gold back off. Is there any reason that I couldn't use a stamping tool? Like if I was doing say 20 or 22 gauge like flat silver or you know silver sheet or gold sheet that you could use that same stamping tool? I mean, it'd be worth it to try it as an experiment. My concern is that stamps are sharp and you might tear your gold. But not all stamps are sharp. And if you're just pressing with your finger pressure rather than hammering it, it might be okay. These are artist trading cards. You can get these through most art suppliers. They come in white and black. I have a black one that I really like. Um, build one of these, you know, just gild the hell out of it. it part of my language, tool it, play with it. We're being recorded and I'm cussing. I mean, it's wonderful. Um, but yeah, tool it, play with it, experiment with it. And I love doing the artist trading cards because they're so much less intimidating than doing a practice scroll. If I don't like this, I can just pitch it and have a clear conscience. 
if I do like it, I keep it and it goes into my teaching materials or I keep it as a record of, you know, what worked and what didn't, etc. But I, yeah, I, I've never used the stamps. What I had when I had them, I went to Michael's, excuse me, and they had, uh, they were called embossing styluses. And I think they're used in scrapbooking. And it was a three pack of styluses for five bucks. And I used only the smallest one, but five bucks for one tool is still pretty good. Five bucks for three tools gives you a lot of options to work with. Um, I do know some of the tooling that they did involve scoring straight lines. So I'm wondering if maybe they used a knife blade or something like that. Um, in that case, it might be smarter to tool the gesso first and then gild over it. I'm not really sure. I haven't played with it. I want to. That would be a lot of fun. There's also nail art styluses with little blobs of different sizes that they make dots with that can make yeah. some nice, neat, perfectly round little dots. And some of them don't have little ends. They're like little points. Hmm. Yeah, that dotted tools. Cool. You know, more and more, I'm hearing that nail art has the paintbrushes that we want and the styluses that we want. Don't use their paint, though. I don't think that would be very wise. But, well, it kind uh, of makes sense. You're you're working on an even smaller artist card. You're yeah, working definitely. on a nail. Right, right. They're working small. Um, if you're into gaming at all, gaming stores often have small enough brushes to work on miniatures, so it, it can be good to find those. But people who insist that you absolutely have to have a teeny brush. This is a hill I will die on. I have done scrolls with brushes this big before because you see that wicked, wicked point? That's all you need. You can do all the detail work and this is full of paint, which means it goes forever and it's wonderful. That has nothing to do with gilding. That's just a hill I'm willing to die on because it's, it's a soapbox of mine. Uh, uh, if you're trying to get into a certain shape, like, yeah. like your pointy ends. Do you have any tips for getting the gesso slash paint in general to go into that small Mine. end um, without having issues? Yeah. How do you um, make a fine point? Yeah. <laughs> yeah the, 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 way, the way I describe it is teasing. You're not dragging the brush across the page you are hovering above the page that doesn't really show on this camera and dragging the liquid. So let's go ahead and demonstrate that a little bit here. I gotta stir this up a little, it's already started to settle. Also, do you just stir the gesso with a brush? I do, because I'm horrible and lazy. And also I figure a gentle brush is less likely to put air bubbles in it. I'm gonna rinse my brush. And you actually, this particular recipe, they, they recommend not mixing it with water to thin it or anything. So I'm going to dry my brush. So I'm not introducing any water. What's that? With? Sorry, do, do they recommend something to thin it with? Um, since it separates the material that's on top, if you pour that off and then stir it and then pour it back in, you can thin it a little bit. Um, that description didn't make very much sense, but his videos do. Anyway, so I've got a drop here. I'm gonna put it in the middle. I need a bigger drop. And you just sort of drip it into place, right? And it's already gonna to start to spread on its own. But what you do is you just tease it. I've got an air bubble too. And the other thing that happens if you don't get perfect air bubbles, or perfect air bubbles, if you don't get perfect edges, it's not the end of the world because what'll happen, once this is all gilded, you take your pen and ink and you outline it. And that'll give you nice crisp edges and points and what have you. So if this is a little bit wobbly, if it's a little curvy on, on the tip, you draw a nice sharp point and the eye is fooled and everyone's like, oh, that's a nice sharp point you got there. And you say, yes, thank you. But yeah, you sort of tease this. Oh, that air bubble's gonna drive me nuts. It keeps floating back up to the top of the pool, but I can drag it with my paintbrush. See how it keeps moving? 
like having a bead in there. It's really irritating. It'll pop eventually. Um, a period thing to do to get rid of air bubbles, and this is really gross. Take a bobby pin and some earwax. Yes, it's disgusting, but it is period and it'll pop the bubble. I don't know why. I don't know how, but it does. So, you know, if you feel like you just have way too many air bubbles in there, a, a, a pin with some earwax will take care of it. It's gross, but that's what we do. Um, the other thing to do is not introduce any to start with. When this is separated, for the love of all that is holy, don't shake it. That would be bad. Um, I think I already mentioned this. The first time I got this out of the fridge, it was super thick, like sludge. And I thought I was going to have to stir it to get it to behave. So I just filled it with air bubbles. It was so bad. And then I proceeded to try and gild with it. And that's why my commission piece is full of dimples and bumps and everything else. Yeah. So I have a lot of repair work ahead of me, but it's because I got impatient. If you just let this stuff sit 10, 15 minutes, it's at room temperature and you don't have to introduce air bubbles into it. But do you see how just teasing it gets the pointy shape that you're after? Let me see if I can bring this closer to the camera. Up a little bit. Does that, does that show a little bit? Okay, yeah. And even if it's not perfect under the microscope, you draw your pointy shape afterwards and you're fine. Um, in another class that I taught this on Saturday, somebody asked if you need to worry about your pencil marks and the answer is no. You really don't. Um, you're going to cover them and then you're going to ink them. They're going to, you don't, you don't have to worry about getting your eraser in and around the gesso. That would be a nightmare. I can't imagine. I usually ignore pencil lines anyway, because depending on your time period, leaving the lines in was part of the aesthetic. And I'm like, I'm not going to erase all that stuff. I'm just going to leave it there. It depends on the time period, but if you can get away with it, don't worry about your pencil lines. Or only erase the ones that are really heinous. Um, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I, was, I was just about to say it's about a quarter till, so if we have any other questions, and you do. Yeah. I, sorry, lots of questions. Um, so you mentioned that you were going to do some troubleshooting work on your commission piece because it does have a lot of those, like, puckers mm -hmm. and stuff. Are mm -hmm. you basically going to... Are you going to try and do more gesso on it, or are you going to try and fix it with like like what are some sort of troubleshooting tips? Yeah, you're asking to... you're asking the real questions. Um, one person, uh, a Laurel, suggested to me that you get a nail file. Now I'm a little reluctant. No, really, where to go? I'm a little reluctant because these are so small and so close together that if I want to try and file this, my file is laying over all of that. Hmm. And if I bend the paper, I risk cracking the gesso. So I'm a little reluctant. It works some around the edges. I was able to get it to work somewhat. Uh, the other thing that I've heard is very fine grit sandpaper. I really would not go any coarser than 250. I was thinking 600, personally. Really, really fine sandpaper. Um, I don't have any sandpaper right now, and the file was like $1.50, so that's why I have the file. The other thing well, you're supposed to be able to, to do... do your gilding from like the middle out or from an edge where you're not working over anything that you've already done, that you leave yourself like a clear space? Is that something you would... That makes way too much sense. I'm never going to do that. <laughs> um, no, that's not a bad idea. Um, I, if you look at it, I sort of have clear spaces where I've got flowers in here. I've got kind of so I can work around, but eh. um, really once all this is down, I can breathe and activate a large area and slap this whole sheet on top of it if I wanted to. The main thing is I'm trying to repair the gesso beforehand. And supposedly the burnishing will take care of a lot of errors. And in fact, that big, huge bump just went away. For some of the really bad dimples, I went back and tried to paint and fill in. And I ended up with nipples. 
but I would rather have a raised area that I can file or sand or, or burnish down than have a big divot, a big hole in there. So those were the things that were more of a challenge to get rid of. Now here's, here's the one with the really bad divot. I'm gonna try and burnish that and see what happens. Do you think you could also potentially like uh, mount a small little bit of sandpaper to like a, a small tiny dowel so you'd be able to use it without sanding everything else? Well, what go I would back, to do is wrap back it around to, my finger. Yeah, or go back to your, uh, your Sally Duty Salon or whatever into the nail area and pick up some orange sticks. And um, then you could take the sandpaper and wrap it around the orange stick and that, and, or, or tack it onto the orange stick. Sure. One, one thing I was thinking of doing was just wrapping it around my finger and just, you know, rub here, rub here. And I would be able to feel it so I'd have a little bit better control over it what was, was what I had in mind. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's that's sort of. I mean, it's shiny now. There's still a divot, but it's not as obvious. So, I mean, that's got potential. If it's if it's really really bad, I suppose I would paint over it again one more time and try and build up a layer. And again, if you end up with a nipple, well, at least I mean, it's a design feature. Yeah. My client is not in the SCA. She's going to take one look at this and go, ooh, gold, shiny, wonderful, thank you. How much do I pay you? But I got standards. <laughs> I don't want it to look bad if I can make it look good. Um, some of the areas, there was a big air bubble right here that I was able to sand out. And burnishing it looks like I'm going to have just the very tiniest of dots there. So when I gild that, that's hardly going to be noticeable. So that's a relief. Um, what else? What else? Yeah, this particular piece was, I just got impatient. Don't get impatient. <laughs> Don't fill your gesso full of air bubbles. Um, I mean, there's plenty of troubleshooting that I can suggest, but most of it comes down to don't give yourself trouble in the first place. You know what how I mean? Does, um, how yeah. does the gild, the gold uh act around paint around so paint if you're trying to paint and you accidentally like budge up against the gold is that the end of the world depending on like say you're using um uh shoot, wash nope because it's water soluble and this is metal it'll bead and resist it's okay. actually really great if you use gold and then paint around it you'll you'll be able to go right up to the edges and get nice crisp edges and it highlights the gold even more because the paint is touching the gold. It is right up next to the edge. And that's kind of cool. Um, if you are working with gold paint and then you try to go through with a color, you worry about overlapping the paint and ruining your edge. But this is a nice raised edge. Your paintbrush is going to just go bump and that's the edge. And you, you know, if you get up on here, you can wipe it off. It's pretty that's sweet. Fair. And again, that's real gold. People in period did paint onto gold, but as far as I can tell, that was mostly shell gold. Shell gold is powdered gold. That's a whole other skill set. Um, it tends to dry slightly matte, which means it'll grab the paint a little bit better so you can paint directly onto it. Whereas this is gonna be a shiny sheet and especially if it's a large area, you put the paint on there and the paint will bead and resist. Um, I have painted onto gold leaf before and what I did was first I went through with a flat size and painted my shape, like I was doing a flower or whatever. So I painted a flower shape in the adhesive and let the adhesive dry. And then I put the paint where the adhesive was and it gave enough tack that it didn't resist on the gold. But I don't know if that's what they did in period. I don't know if they painted on gold leaf very much or if they just mostly used shell. Any more questions? We've got 10 minutes. Otherwise, I can gossip or, you know, we can wrap up class or a little early, whatever you want to do. Um, I guess I, I didn't get the step of um, when your gesso comes out of the fridge, you've let it come to room temperature and it's slightly mm -hmm. separated. You will not be shaking it, but will you be stirring it? Stirring it gently, yes. 
If you stir too vigorously, you mix air bubbles in, but if you stir gently, it'll be all right. Um, and that, again, that's why I use my paintbrush instead of the other end of the paintbrush, because I worry that I'll get too many air bubbles with a stick, and this seems a little gentler. I could be wrong. I could be completely making stuff up, but that's been my experience, is that it seems to introduce fewer air bubbles if you use the bristles. Of course, then you have a brush that's completely loaded up to the ferrule with gesso, and you want to rinse it but it seems to do the trick. Um, if you go to the Facebook event, there is a link there to my class handout. You don't need the handout to participate in the class, obviously, but it should serve as a nice refresher, a little bit of a reminder of the steps that I used. And what is this? This is my absentee ballot form. That's not a teaching aid set that aside but yeah i've got a materials list i've got um basic basic notes about the difference between regular gesso and gilder's gesso and then i've got a step-by-step -step, here's how you do it the absolutely crucial step 14 is to hold your work up to the light and move it back and forth so it sparkles and then smile proudly at what you've accomplished because that's important well, it's like bacon. Gold makes everything better, as does bacon. Oh, it does. Maybe we should gild bacon and see what happens. That might be too much awesome in one place, though. <laughs> I get uh, a little I, weird. <laughs> I, I very I much enjoy I, this. And Sorry, go ahead. I, I used uh, some uh, double weight, uh, Sanini weight, um, the stuff on the paper, and you're supposed to be able to lay it down, pick it back up again like you had just demonstrated. Mm -hmm. I mix it up if it's patent or whatever. It's uh, and I lay it down and all kinds of it just fell off and was lying on my paper. Like, yeah, it, it didn't stay on the paper. It yeah. just plopped off once it was upside down. That is a static electricity. It's, it's, there's, no ad, there's no adhesive here. It's just static charge. So if you're in an especially humid area or if you flip it over, tack part of it down and pull a little funny you can take the whole sheet with you this one's trying to come off where is it it's trying to come off right here it's curled over on itself it's trying to come off here when that happens it's basically loose leaf you can you can keep working with it it's still gold the other thing that i have done in the past because this stuff is so great just stick it on your finger and then put it where you want it to go and it'll stick i didn't activate that i didn't breathe on it so it's not very good but it's gilded oh uh that that raises another question say yeah. like this happened and maybe you tried to activate it but it, for whatever reason it didn't activate as well as you'd like mm. so you could just like if you breathe on it again you're breathing on mostly gold leaf if you tried to stick it on rather than the gesso? Well, yeah, but you'll still activate the gesso that's exposed. And since real gold does stick to itself, having a little moisture there is not going to hurt it. So, so yeah, I've actually done that before where I went and I gilded it and I went, oh, that's not very pleasant. And I breathe on it again and I do it again. Uh, there's also one of the guys I go to for advice. He's a professional. He is a skatey and he's out of Australia. His name is Mark Calderwood. He is phenomenal. I mean, his work looks like Da Vinci did it. It's just incredible. He knows his stuff. And he, being Australia, it's a drier, hotter climate, says that sometimes what he has to do is keep a mug of hot tea handy. And he'll take a drink of hot tea, get the heat and the moisture going in his mouth, and then activate the gesso and then it behaves just fine. So if you just don't have enough humidity, you can make your own. <laughs> but yeah, it, it, another thing that'll happen, it's been rainy here today. It's been kind of humid for the past several days. So I can activate it and wait a couple seconds and talk to you about it and then stick the gold on, right? And it's still gonna stick. 
Whereas if the air, if the weather's a little bit drier, if it's the middle of winter, I may want to have the sheet in one hand and the gold in the other and just immediately slap it down to make sure that it's going to behave. I mean, it, it really, it depends. It is definitely humidity um, responsive for sure. When I had um, some of those big pieces lying around on mm -hmm. my scroll being annoying, if I touched it with my finger, it just broke up, tried to pick it up with tweezers, broke up, tried to slide other things underneath it, stuck to the other things. So I couldn't really work with, like, if I'd already done the gilding I wanted to do, or if I wanted to get it the hell back onto the glassine, is there a way to handle it? There's not really a way to get it back onto the tissue paper. Um, a very gentle touch with tweezers will do it, or what a lot of people use when they're working with loose leaf, there's a special brush called a gilder's tip. And you sort of get the bristles under there and gently lift. And the bristles are soft enough, they can grip the gold without breaking it up. Uh, gilder's tips are expensive. I have been known to just use my mop. Just very gently get under there and pick it up. Now, my other mop that I used to own was not as bulky as this, so I don't know how well this one would work for the purpose. But uh, if you're having a hard time with tweezers or your finger, try something softer. Try, try a soft brush and see how that works. And if it still doesn't work, then just brush it off and curse at it and you know proceed to the next area to gild. That's probably not very helpful. I hope that's helpful. Well, it was a very expensive endeavor because I went through two sheets of this for one scroll um, mm. because of making so many mistakes. It was really, really thick. <laughs> um, but, uh, oh shoot, where was I going with that? <laughs> uh, Darren, yes, I've heard of cutting little pieces. Mm -hmm. but I'm thinking if you go at it with scissors and try to get your glassine and your gold to come off in little convenient little squares, that seems like it is unlikely to work. Right, and what I've heard people doing that with you can, your scissors have to be absolutely free of oils if you handle the blades at all your hose. Um, I usually, I don't do it, but what I've heard people do is that they cut or they, they wash their scissors with rubbing alcohol to get all the oils off of it. And they've got to be very, very sharp scissors to cut through both materials at the same time. And then you've got it. The other thing that people do when they work with loose leaf is they use a gilder's knife and a gilder's cushion. And a gilder's cushion is a pillow. I actually made one. Um, it's got a wooden base and a suede or a, if you, if you, I went to AutoZone and I got a chamois, you know, a polishing, a car polishing cloth. It's, it's leather. It's very fine suede leather. And I used that and I filled it with stuffing and then I nailed it to the wood and it worked great. It was a lovely cushion and it's got enough give to it. You put your loose leaf sheet onto the cushion and then you use your gilder's knife and you rock back and forth to separate your blade, uh, to separate your um, gold leaf. The other thing I used to do, um, I would separate it into squares by taking a scalpel or an X-Acto knife and sometimes slicing the straight line didn't do me any good. So I would tease it. I would, I would go rip, 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 rip along the side until I got, I mean, it would have a ragged edge, but it would be the size that I wanted. And then I could pick that up and work with it. So, I mean, eh, not great, but it's what I did. The, the real tools that you would use would be a gilder's knife and gilder's cushion. You can build a gilder's cushion for a about the cost of the chamois. I think it cost me like 10 bucks. You can buy a gilder's cushion for like 75. So, I mean, it's up to you, <laughs> but uh, um, it's not hard to construct one at all. Just start with a square piece of wood, like an inch thick was what I had and tack it down on the bottom with a stapler or with a nail gun or whatever, and then just fill it with fiber fill stuffing from, from the fabric store. It is now eight o'clock. We can keep going if we have any more questions. Rum Chancellor has said that we can keep going if we want, but I, I've pretty much run out of things to, to explain. I mean, I've gilded. 
I've shown you the shiny. I encourage you to go forth and make your own shiny because gilding is awesome. Is there anything else? Nope, just got to try it now. Yes, you do. Yeah. And I want to see your results come into Facebook or um, I have a blog as well. The name of the blog is littlefiddlybits.blogspot.com because I like the little, I like the details. I like the fussy stuff. So that's the name of my blog is Little Fiddly Bits. Swing by there and drop me a comment with a picture of your work or a link to your Instagram or something. I would love to see your results from this. And I hope that it helps you. This is a little bit pricey, but it's gonna last you a long time. And it is, like I said, in the 15 or so years that I've been scribing, this is the best gilding material I have ever worked with. I'm not going back. You couldn't pay me to use something else. from where? Uh, got it at John Neal, but you can also go to the maker's website and order it from him directly. I think there's a dollar difference in price, if that. Also, this is a quarter ounce bottle. John Neal has quarter ounce and half ounce. Mr. Tresser has quarter ounce, half ounce, and full ounce bottles. And the full ounce is um, $40. But it's, you know, four times as much as this. It'll last you a good long time. Hmm. I had the clever idea of slapping two pieces of double, double weight uh, um, together and uh, burnishing that to have something a little bit more easy to handle since it's going to be multiple layered anyway. Hmm. Worth it to try. You know, go ahead and experiment. This stuff, the thing about gilding is people get very intimidated and most of the intimidation factor I think comes from how expensive it is and how delicate it is. But once you start handling it, it actually takes a beating better than you think it would. So that takes away a lot of the intimidation factor. And if you just play and experiment and do artist trading cards like this, you're not committing to a whole scroll. You're not gonna waste an entire book of gold. You're just gonna waste you know, maybe a sheet, maybe half a sheet. I've taught this gilding class twice and used up half of one sheet of my book. And that is all that gilding and all this gilding. I thought I had, yeah. And all this gilding, half a sheet of gold. So, I mean, don't be afraid to play with it. It's worth its weight. Oh, that's a horrible pun. It's, it's really, you get what you pay for with art supplies and the composite gold is almost not worth the money. It, it, it's just, it doesn't behave the same it is not as forgiving since gold sticks to itself it's actually it'll it'll allow you more room to make mistakes and correct them than the composite stuff will so i definitely encourage you to get the real stuff where where's the good spot to get real gold from you can get real gold from la gold leaf you can get real gold from john neal um don't get from amazon because a lot of times you know, they'll talk about how it's oh yeah it's real it's from china and it's super thin and full of holes like pinholes or it's not actually real gold if you're paying three bucks for a book i'm here to tell you it's probably not the real thing um oh gosh icon iconography like orthodox religious websites will have gold sources because they use a lot of gold um but two, oh oh wait actually um mr tresser sells gold on his website so if you go to jtresser.com and scroll down you'll find a place where you can get gold leaf and i think he buys in bulk and passes on the savings because the like a gold leaf book right now is retailing for about 60 bucks and he's managing to sell them for 37. i was on his website just today looking for more information about the the gesso and everything so, I mean, it's worth it to look. Um, but yeah, LA Gold for sure, John Neal for sure. I can't remember any websites other than them off the top of my head, but I know they're out there, especially icon iconography. Oh, Iconophile. I-C-O-N-O-F-I-L-E. Iconophile sells gilding supplies because they make icons, they make religious icons. 
so they would have some good gold, but I don't what I don't remember what their prices are like. I know they've got a huge selection of burnisher stuff. So I mean, you really are only gonna need a dog tooth because it's got a nice broad edge, it's got a decent point, and those are what you want most. There's also a burnisher called a lipstick burnisher because it looks like a brand new tube of lipstick. It's got a very flat edge and a sharp corner to it. And then there's what's called a pencil burnisher, which comes to a fine point. Um, those are your three main ones. I've never felt a need to get a lipstick burnisher or a pencil burnisher. Pencils are good for working around, around the edges of your piece or you know, getting into the corners. But this works just fine for that in my experience. So if you feel like expanding your kit and really getting you know, fancy, go for it, but don't feel obligated. I got you can go to a crystal store. Like a you, what's that? That one shaped like a flame? Um, I don't remember seeing that. Maybe. I got it from Kellswood. Huh, cool. And it was only eight dollars, but a lipstick and the dog tooth for seventy and eighty. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it could be the quality of the stone. It could be the quality of the of the handle and setting. It could be that it wasn't really agate. I don't know. You can go to a crystal store and buy a polished agate or a polished hematite for like three bucks, and they'll work. You won't be able to get into edges because you basically have a tumbled stone. There are no you know, narrow edges to it, no points, no nothing. But for large areas and flat surfaces, that'll that'll suffice. So if your budget is limited, go ahead and do that. And what about an actual dog tooth? I have heard that that's what they used in period. And you may be able to talk to your vet because they do tooth extractions. Yeah, and I think it, it, it could be free, uh, and sometimes you see it in um, stores, you know, on, on necklaces sort of thing, some kind of a tooth. Um, the, it may be more coarse than an agate in that shape. Maybe. I mean, it's tooth enamel, which is usually pretty smooth, and the reason they call this a dog tooth burnisher is because it's shaped like a dog's tooth, and I remember reading that a dog's tooth is what they originally used, so I mean, it's, again, worth it to try. Go ahead and experiment. Talk to your veterinarian, um, see if they have teeth for you. Or wow. um, there are bone suppliers for people who do bone um, arts and crafts. So you may be able to get teeth from them. Like there's a store in San Francisco, I think, that does nothing but sell skulls. They're nothing but animal skulls and human skulls. And I don't even, if you need a skull, but there's a good chance that they would have teeth too. So I'm sure there's a supplier somewhere, but you, you may have to dive down the rabbit hole a little bit to find them. There's a skull and skeleton place right beside, um, I think it's Natural History Museum in, in New York. Oh, And cool. it's got sort of a creepy name like Skull and Bones or something like that. And the whole shop is just filled with skeletons. It's yeah. associated with that museum. Hmm. Whatever, whatever makes people happy, I guess. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, if you're looking for an actual tooth, I'm sure there's a supplier out there. I've always just used the agate ones because they're lovely and they do the job. Another quick question. Um, yeah. So you know how the leaf kind of disintegrates a little bit when, when you have like an odd shape? Mm -hmm. um, I've heard that you could use the, the little leftover bits to make shell gold or something, or do you typically you keep the glitter bits? I used to keep, do you know how you go to the restaurant and you order salad and the salad dressing comes out in one of those little bitty containers? Yeah. yeah. I had containers filled with gold, white gold, and copper. And I kept them for years, planning to eventually make shell gold with them. And then I found a book that gave instructions on how to make shell gold. Start with two books of gold leaf were their instructions. And I went, oh. I don't have enough gold crumb here at all. <laughs> but yes, you can, because what you're doing is you're taking the leaves and breaking them down into, um, somebody I was talking to just today calls it crumb, the gold crumb. Um, and, and you need to break it down anyway, so you may as well start with stuff already broken down, but because it breaks down so fine and so tiny, 
you need a lot. And, and because gold leaf itself is so thin, you need a lot of it. But yeah, if you have a little container with a lid and you want to, you know, scrape up and, and like I've got glitter right here and I've got my mop, if I had a little container, I could just sweep all this up and put it in my container and call it good. So yeah, you absolutely can do that. Or um, I did a scroll where I used several sheets of gold leaf and there are all these little bits and scraggly things like, like right here left over on the page. I just brushed them off and into the container and then threw away the paper once it was completely empty. So yeah, you absolutely can salvage your gold and you know, get a little bit of, you know, uh, instead of not wasting it, if that makes sense. Can you stick your finger in that puddle of stuff and then plop your finger onto the gesso? Yeah, um, you can. If you have large enough pieces like these right here, I could use that to patch or repair a sloppy gilling job. Like if I covered this and I had just a little bit that was where the gesso was still exposed, I would take some of this, I would take one of my patches or one of my crumbs and I would just hold it and do that. You can, you can use tweezers for those. I highly recommend getting yourself elbow tweezers and if at all possible, reverse elbow tweezers. Most tweezers stay open until you squeeze them. Reverse tweezers stay closed until you squeeze them. There's a lot less strain on your hand. Um, they, they cross over in the middle and then close. And so when you squeeze them, they, they open is, is how that works. Reverse tweezers are very cool. And the elbow tweezers mean that you don't have a sharp corner snagging on your gold and breaking it. I think if you're using regular tweezers, that may, may have been part of your problem um, with your gold pieces breaking up on your scroll would be a guess or something worth trying at least. Anybody else? I think we're done. Um, keep your gold, keep your gold in the book, gentle with it. Heather, how do you yes. think you, how do you think you spell out iconophile site? I see O N O S I L E. Okay. Thank you. file. Thank you. Yeah. I have my sheet in here sideways. That's why it's not fitting. There we go. Like you think they're square, but they're not. They're just ever so slightly rectangular. It goes back in the glassine envelope. And since I'm not wanting to risk it, I used to have a toolbox with lots of drawers and I had a separate drawer for my gold leaf so it wouldn't get knocked around. Now I have a cookie tin. I'm going to replace the cookie tin with a proper toolbox as soon as I can. But in the meantime, I'm keeping it in the shipping envelope, keeping it sturdy, keeping it safe. Thank you all. If you have any more questions, don't hesitate to reach me on Facebook or to hit my blog, like I said. Um, if you want, my email is on the class handout. So feel free to, to send me questions privately if you wanna do that. I love hearing from people and I totally wanna to see your results when you do building. Thank you so much, I learned a lot. Yay, Thank I'm you. glad, Thank you. Yes, and you always teach in a very non-threatening fashion, and it feels so doable. Yeah. It really is doable, I promise. If, if I am very much self-taught, I have attended classes where they made the thing, whatever they were teaching, seem so arcane and fussy and fiddly. I was like, I'm never going to do this. I remember once, it was a class on turning powdered pigments into paint. And you had to get the levels just right and you had to mix it so carefully, and you had to this, and you had to that, and I went, oh my God, I'm never gonna do this. And then I went to Penzik, and the teacher there was like, no, you start with your gum Arabic, which should be the consistency of snot. I went, that's disgusting. She goes, yes, but you'll remember it, won't you? And you mix your powdered pigment in until it's the consistency of toothpaste. I said, okay. And she said, and you're done. I said, what? She goes, yeah, from there you add water to thin it and then you paint with it. 
And then I was like, I can do that. And so I ended up buying a whole bunch of powdered pigments and making paint and having a great time. So yeah, it's, it's not arcane. It's delicate. It takes patience. Don't do it outdoors until you really have the hang of it. No, don't do it outdoors. <laughs> don't even like, even if you're doing like a demo for, for the public, I would not recommend gilding outdoors. Not with loose leaf anyway, definitely use patent for that. Um, but, but it's definitely doable and it's so much fun and it's so worth it. The results just will curl your toes. I, I love gilding entirely too much. Have a great night, everybody. And like I said, I really want to see the results when you start gilding.